I want to welcome all of you, friends. family, colleagues, present, past, but most of all, students. Because you, although occasionally frustrating me, also nourished me, kept me going for 40 years at Fort Silicon. And I do appreciate that. I really do. I'm going to echo Lou Gehrig's words. Today, I feel like the luckiest man on the face of the earth. To have had such a good career, so many good people helping me along the way. But I have to tell you, unlike Lou Gehrig, I'm not dying of some dread disease. And I know that there was a final lecture given uh, a few years back. And I'd actually thought of doing this before he did his. And so I purposely avoided listening to it or watching it because I didn't want to cross-contaminate. But now this summer, I can finally read his final lecture, which I understand was pretty poignant. This is going to be, I hope, a positive, uplifting experience. Uh, I'm going to talk about things I've learned in the past 40 years of teaching, as well as thanking some of the many people who've helped me along the way. And I know I'm not going to be able to thank everybody, but several of the key players are definitely here today. I've never given my final lecture before, <laughs> so I have no idea how long it'll last. I, I hope to be about a period, about a 50-minute period. Uh, I also don't know how smoothly it'll go. Normally, I've given a lecture at this point 40, 50, 100, 150 times, and I can actually do it from memory. Uh, this is newly created, so I may have to look down. In fact, I know I'll have to look down because I don't want to miss anything. That I put down in the notes. For those of you who've had me as a teacher, you know, I teach by anecdotes, stories. I've always believed that the concepts will be re better maintained if a story is attached to it. And so I'll be telling stories today, including stories that well, involve people in this room for certain. Okay. I got to go back to the very beginning, actually before I started teaching here. We used to do outdoor orientations for our students. Uh, I wish we still did. They were wonderful. We made attachments. Uh, I mean, they lasted and lasted and lasted. But the very first meeting I had with the college was the summer of 71. And the first outing, I believe, was a hike to Snow Lake up by Alpenthal. And as I was queuing up in the parking lot, I met a guy by the name of Dennis Morton. Dennis with his little cute cheeks, his little dimply knees. <laughs> and he actually had a pair of lederhosen on. <laughs> you remember that. Dennis and I became fast friends and uh, team taught for 35 years together. This is Dennis Morton. Those of you... Those of you who have taken the human sex class in the last couple of years, it was done solo by me, but I would refer to Dennis quite frequently because we were a team for so many years. And in fact, our joke was we actually outlasted our first two marriages, which is not a funny <laughs> joke, <laughs> but uh, there's truth to it. Uh, we were close for a number of years. So what did I learn from Dennis? Dennis used to say with some frequency, humans are put on earth to... Well, that was his good version. <laughs> Depending on his mood, it was screw up, foul up, or F up. And uh, I didn't quite get it at first. How many of you suffer from perfectionistic ideals? Yeah, it's one of my faults. I, I wanted to be perfect. I wanted to do everything right. And of course, nobody is perfect, and uh, it really bothered me. But Dennis helped me. And through the years, I've gotten better at being able to make mistakes and not feel terrible about it. In fact, even laugh it off, as I did the other day when I failed to record a week's worth of papers. <laughs> I laughed it off, and I, I made it right. That's why I'm retiring, right? 
Anyway, Dennis was kind of my uh, first introduction to Albert Ellis. And those of you who teach psych or know psych, you know Albert Ellis. He came out with the masturbations and the tyranny of the shoulds. And I would say this, every one of you should print a list of his irrational beliefs and keep it on the wall of your office. This is, this is serious. You're going to find at least three or four of them are faults that you hold. One of them wanting everything to be perfect. And if it's not perfect, it's a disaster. Dennis helped me with that before I knew about Albert Ellis. And I'm really grateful of that. Jim and Kay Mullen, stand up, show the crowd. <laughs> at least put your hands up. Jim taught psychology here. In fact, he came before me. He was at Albertson U, one of the original founders. Some of you know that we started in the Albertsons in Lakewood Center, which is now a goodwill, I believe. Uh, so he predates me. He's one of the originators. When I got hired, I wanted to be Jim Mullen. He probably doesn't know this, but I would actually lurk about his classroom watching. And I was so taken by his fluidity, his smoothness, the responses he got from his students. And I envied him. I wanted so much for that to be me. And it wasn't. I had a very, very herky-jerky start. Part of that perfectionism, I wanted every student to love psychology and love me. I quickly realized that wasn't happening. And I actually resigned on February 14th of the first year I taught here. Dr. Oppelt, the president of the college, would not accept my resignation. It was a very difficult time, uh, having put in two years of graduate work to teach and not feeling I could do it. But Jim and Kay, who served also as surrogate parents for my wife and I, because our parents didn't live nearby, they weren't too far away, could always go out to dinner, and they'd be supportive, excellent surrogate parents. I went out there in the fit of depression one night, thinking my life is basically over. I can't teach. What am I going to do? Albertsons wouldn't even hire me because they said you have too much education. <laughs> Very frustrating. But anyway, I went out there, and uh, Jim took me outside. And I don't know if he remembers this. But he put his arm around me, and he says, look up at the stars, Marty. And I did. Then he said, now ask yourself, how big am I? And it came through. All of a sudden, I realized, once again, another Albert Ellison idea. I had catastrophized. I had taken the failure and thought, everything's over. My life is you know, in total disrepair. And I kind of laughed. I still remember laughing. And luckily, the resignation was not accepted. I came back, and uh, things got better. But I have to tell you this. Dennis Morton got the same group of students the next quarter. <laughs> How was it, Dennis? It just sucked. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a real unique group. And uh, yeah, it was very difficult. But anyway, I, I, I remember that so well, because truly, he saved my career and possibly me. But it also reminds me of something I heard a little bit later. I'm a huge fan of the film Casablanca. I think there are just so many great lines that come out of it. One of them, Rick turns to Ilsa, and he says, the problems of three little people don't amount to a hill of beans in this crazy world. Here's looking at you, kid. <laughs> Classic, OK? And for those of you who catastrophize, man, that's one of the things. You know, we're all going to have downfalls. We're all going to have problems. And if we build them into huge mountains that we can't climb up, our lives are going to be very, very difficult. It's much better to learn from our mistakes and move forward. And I learned that slowly but surely. Okay. Keith Foreman. Where'd Keith go? I've never told him this, I don't think, but Keith Foreman saved my life, literally. 
When I started here, I was sedentary, overweight, smoked nearly two packs of cigarettes a day. Uh, I was probably on target for a death in my late 40s or early 50s. My mother did pass in her early 50s. My dad had his first stroke in his late 40s. But Keith was here, and uh, he's such a humble guy. He's a world-class athlete who was the fourth American to run a sub four, fifth American, I'm sorry, fifth American to run a, run a sub four minute mile. He and three other men set a world's record in the four by mile relay, okay, Helsinki, something like that. He doesn't talk much about this. <laughs> Keith was runner. And I thought, you know, maybe I should try it. And he encouraged me. And I still remember lacing up my Chuck Taylor, <laughs> that's for bocce, my Chuck Taylor Converse All-Stars, and running about a half mile and truly thinking I was going to die. <laughs> my face turned beet red. I couldn't catch my breath. It was terrible. But he encouraged me. He says, don't worry about distance. Just try to go a little further when you can. And he was so good at it, he would run with me, even though you know, I was a toad. I mean, I was just so <laughs> slow. I remember when I got to be a better runner one day, we were going to try to work out together. I think he'd already done 10 miles at a sub-six pace. And I picked him up. I couldn't keep up with him for the next five, and I was fresh. Uh, he was always a person who I ran behind. But he taught me the value of being in shape. And I think it's why I am alive today. And I think especially young people in America, it's so sad how many are out of shape, terribly overweight, running risk of type 2 diabetes, early heart disease, strokes, et cetera, et cetera. And you don't have to be a super athlete. I'm on the wellness committee here. And this fall, we're putting together a handout for our staff here to get them to do a little exercise in the office. Believe it or not, you know, about 20, 30 minutes a day of even vigorous walking can make a big difference physically and mentally. So anyway, uh, don't be a super athlete. In fact, probably I shouldn't have run as much as I did. Uh, my knees now tell me <laughs> about <clears throat> that. Okay. Moving on. When I first started teaching here, I was actually younger than virtually every student I had in class. I was 24. The average age of students, I believe, was close to 30. When I taught lifespan development the first time, I have never felt so inadequate. I'm in a room, and I was, in fact, the youngest. I think I may have been the only person in the room who didn't have children or grandchildren. And I'm telling them about lifespan development. Wow. I can remember <laughs> some of the older, wiser students just looking at me and just <laughs> <laughs> And I knew I had a lot to learn. Well, well, luckily, in 1973, we had a daughter, Beth, and she's down in California. I'm going to send a DVD so she gets to see this. In 75, we had a son, Christopher. He's working. In fact, he may be in Alaska. Is he in Alaska, anybody? Uh, I'm not sure if he is, but... He works and couldn't be here, but two wonderful children. And suddenly I realized a lot of what I'd been teaching was just theory. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like having kids to change your view of psychology. That was very good. Now each of my children have two children, so I've got four beautiful grandchildren, and it's quite, quite nice, okay? When I hear students say they don't want to marry or they don't want to have kids, trust me, uh, there's just so much more to your life when you have a partner and when you have your own children, okay? Moving to the early 80s, I had a crazy notion to become division chairman, and I'm not sure exactly why. I actually had a belief, and I've shared it with a few of my colleagues, that each of us should serve in that quasi-administrative position. So you have an understanding of FTEs and and why you have to balance budgets and, and the stuff that you have to do administratively. So I took it on, and it was at a, in my view, a very bad time for the college. 
we had a president, I'll just mention first name, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell the older people know exactly who I'm talking about. Anyway, uh, Bob was the president. Dick Mogg, where's Dick? Raise your hand. <laughs> Dick had been division chair and was moved up to dean of instruction. And uh, I then was working under him as the division chair. And one of the things we did every year was set goals for the next year. And so I said, mine are easy. And he says, what? You ready to get? I said, I'd give them off the top of my head. He says, what are they? I said, well, one goal, to be here next year. <laughs> you remember that, Dick? Anyway, he uh, kind of laughed. He says, no, Marty, you got to come up with some serious goals. I said, I'm serious. I want to be here next year. Well, about two months later, I got a phone call from Dick. He said, Marty, you're my boss now. I go, what? He says, I'm back to being a faculty. Yeah, he got axed by the, the president. And uh, I suddenly realized something. Being an administrator can be very tenuous. <laughs> uh, you cross the wrong person or somebody doesn't like your whatever, you can suddenly be gone. Luckily, he was tenured and he came back. But I was always embarrassed. He would call me boss. <laughs> and it was so embarrassing because when he's senior to me, he held a truly administrative position. But also, and he doesn't probably remember this, he helped me so much in terms of managing people. In one of our meetings, and in those days you fought amongst one another for budgetary dollars, it was kind of brutal. It also fought between student and you know, instructional uh, deans. We had a fellow from the library, and he said something that just pissed me off. So instead of handling it in a mature fashion, I kind of turned his expression back and I mocked him. I thought, boy, I'll show him, you know, how you kind of imitate. <laughs> After the meeting ended, Dick asked me to hang around. And he said, I think you really disappointed me. And I thought, well, I actually disappointed myself too. That wasn't very professional. And he said something I've never forgotten. Never mock somebody back. To do that in their voice and kind of repeat what they said, it's ineffective. And it just really lowers you. And that was a powerful piece of learning. He taught me some other things also about administrating that I used in other settings once I stopped being division chair. But I really appreciated that. I really did. Mid to late 80s, divorce. Probably, no, definitely the worst period of my life. Uh, I think most of us marry thinking we're going to stay married forever and ever. And when things start going sideways and relationships don't go right, it can be a real shock. I remember coming into school. And the only thing that saved me was my students. I could go into class and for 50 minutes forget about what was happening in my personal life. It was wonderful, but as soon as I left and went back to my office, I just sat and stared. It was difficult. But then I realized I had to pick things up and start moving again. This is where Keith Foreman actually probably saved my life a second time. I had quit smoking, I believe, in 1976. I was very down, and as the marriage was unwinding, I started smoking again. I don't know if Keith remembers this, but he saw me smoking and he said something like, I can understand you're feeling pretty self-destructive, but why do something so deadly? I thought, yeah, why kill myself over this? So anyway, I quit smoking once again, and probably once again he, he put me on the right direction. As I say, there are people in this room I really do have to thank. About this time, Dennis and I took sabbatical actually more of a leave of absence. We both went back over to Pacific Lutheran University for marriage and family therapy. It was actually quite good for me because I had questions about relationships. It wasn't like my first graduate school where I was just trying to get a degree. I wanted to know answers. And I did quite well in the program. I got some answers. And what I'm gonna do is kind of just run through some of the things I learned about relationships. 
that I truly think if you can not only hear, understand, but employ, and that's the hardest part. I've had so many students listen to my presentations. They hear it, but do they actually use it? And I can tell you in the world of psychology, the proof of learning is actually the performance. Keeping it in your head really doesn't work. So for those of you who haven't heard these, you might try to at least employ a few of them. For those of you who already know it, none of us are perfect. I don't apply all of my learnings every time, but I work toward doing it more frequently. And I think that's the best we can do as humans, going back to Dennis's comment about messing up in our lives and messing up. So, first one. It's not so much what you say, it's the implication drawn by the listener. And that's a real intriguing one. You can be saying what you think is one message, and they can pick it up totally different. And I'll just give an example. It's hypothetical. But for years, I had a cabin up in Packwood. And when I got married the second time, uh, my current wife has a daughter. And let's just say I said to her one day, let's go to the cabin this weekend without your daughter. My thinking is, we can be more intimate, we don't have to deal with a third person, da da da. She could take that to mean what? I don't like her daughter. Whoa! Not meant, but that's what could be received, okay? And this is where I think a lot of our misunderstandings are truly when somebody has heard it and interpreted it differently, from the message we were trying to send. And this is where, if you can ask for clarification, and Dennis and I always stress this when we talked about communication, if you're not sure of what's being said, ask, get clarity. If it really is, I don't like your daughter, we need to deal with that, talk about it. If it's just that I want a little alone time, probably it wouldn't have been an issue. You see what I'm saying? Okay, implications often speak louder than the words. By the way, there's also the flip of it. Sometimes you say something that's meant to be nasty, and they take it positively. <laughs> By the way, on those, I just let it, let it slide. <laughs> Second one, and this is huge. When a woman says there's a problem, listen. <laughs> and be responsive. One of my heroes, I have several, fellow by the name of Gottman out of the University of Washington. And he spent a lot of time analyzing relationships that work and those that fail. He found some fascinating things. Successful relationships, people argue and fight about as frequently as those that are unsuccessful, contrary to what the literature suggested. What he found is that people who are successful in the relationships, they fight, resolve things, and move on to new issues instead of the same thing coming up over and over and over and over again. That's what wears you down in relationship. When you can't resolve it and you feel beat up and you finally say it isn't worth going forward, okay? So he and his colleagues did a study where he took the most at-risk marriages, put groups, pardon me, two subgroups of those most at risk, one kind of traditional communication sort of counseling. The other one, they worked on one thing, the man listening and being responsive to what the partner said. Of the group that did that, they were all intact a year later. Of the group that did the traditional, most as predicted, were separated or divorced. What was funny was, why didn't they say women need to do this? And the answer was pretty simple. Women know this. Women typically do listen and try to respond appropriately to their partner. So guys, this is a real tip. If your lady says, please put the toilet seat down, and you say, well, you could do it as well as I could, <laughs> trust me, you can push a woman, and you can push a woman, but women will tell you, they'll hit a place where something flicks off in their heart, and they no longer love you. And once that flicking happens, you're not going to get it back on. It's done. You might as well start planning the divorce 
or the separation. Okay, what else did I learn? You cannot unring the bell. I love law and order, and of course, you always shout something out in court. You know, the jury will disregard. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Once you've heard it, seen it, it's out there. You can't undo it, okay? And this is where, especially in interpersonal relationships, measure your words, okay? You say something hurtful, it'll ring or echo in their memory forever. You just can't make it go away. So you've got to be very, very careful. This also applies so much to interpersonal stuff at work. Boy, you can say something to a coworker and maybe not even take or mean it that seriously, but it can just ruin relationships. You can't unring the bell. This is a huge piece I learned when I was doing counseling. You cannot control other people. Take control over what you can control, which is yourself. When you're doing counseling, it's so frustrating. People want others to change so they can be the way they are. And I can tell you, the world is not going to change for you. If there are changes, you're going to need to accommodate to the world or accept the way the world is, OK? Whenever I have people who are really down and out, I say, what do you have control over? Nothing my whole life. So can you decide if you take a nap or go to bed early, what you eat? whether you exercise. People, when they're really down and out, forget about the fact they have control over themselves. And that's really all they do have control over. And the rest of the world sometimes is a pretty crazy place, as Bogey said to Bacall. And that wasn't Bacall, what was it? Elsa was Ingrid Berg, or, uh, Bergman. Oh, beautiful girl. She was, what, 17 or 18? <laughs> she was very young, very young. A couple of other things I learned. This is so huge. And I'm not sure where I picked it up. <clears throat> when people divorce, they so frequently want to blame the other person. The other person was a jerk. The other person was a biatch, you know, that sort of stuff. <laughs> and it's, it's so misguided because it doesn't really move you forward. And to place blame on the other doesn't really move anything in a good direction. What I learned was, and I love this, if you have a failed relationship, it's the relationship that failed. And I can prove this, and I do it every time I talk about it in class. Everyone in here has relationships with people where it works. You get together, and it's like a smooth dance. You can talk. It's just easy going. And everybody in here has relationships. When you get together, it's all herky-jerky. You just don't fit. And yet you're the same person. You're a nice guy, right? It's a relationship, OK? Which, by the way, as a marriage and family therapist, is a good thing. Because you can work on relationships, dynamics of relationships, OK? But often when you're working, and you see this too, I'm sure, in your clients, they want to blame somebody instead of realize it's a relationship. You've got to make some changes in how you relate to the other person. Last thing I'm going to say on this, my first wife tried very hard to domesticate me. My second wife is continuing the effort. <laughs> I'm not sure either will totally succeed. But I want to say this, both ladies are going to be vitrified, I'm sure, after their passing. And some of you probably don't know what that means. You can look it up. But I'll give you a clue. It'll be St. Anne, or pardon me, St. Elizabeth Anne and St. Nancy. And uh, for those of you who knew me in the early days, I think Nancy was even referred to as a saint quite often. <laughs> Single again. Ooh, boy. Yeah, got to do repair work. For those of you who've been there, you know what I'm talking about. You need to get yourself back on balance. I met a gal when I was dating as a single again. And she pointed out another one of my recurring flaws. I hate to be wrong. And to be honest, it help, happens not too often. So I don't handle it too well. 
I don't handle it too well, but I am. <laughs> anyway, being wrong is difficult for me. And she said, would you rather be right or have friends? <laughs> and that was a very sobering question. And I made my decision, yeah, I'd rather have friends. And much like not having to be perfect or being able to admit I screw it up, it's another version of that. Uh, I can now admit I make mistakes that I'm wrong. Uh, anyway, it's a healthy thing, and it's so, so easy, okay? The other thing I learned out of the uh, say, marriage and family, no. What was it? Uh, it'll come back to me. Skipped over. Okay. Yeah. I learned something really powerful in the marriage and family curriculum. How many of you know what one downing is? Is that something that's out there a lot? I think it was relatively new to me when I heard it. One downing is where you're in a confrontation with somebody instead of escalating to the next level, you know, oh yeah, and your mother too, that sort of thing, you back down and you say, well, I'm sorry, I guess I made a mistake or, you know, da da da. You step back. And I didn't realize how powerful that was until after that program. It's a good thing. Occasionally I forget it and that's dangerous. Boy, you escalate with the wrong person, it can get really ugly fast. But I work hard at one downing and if you can take one thing away from this, work on one downing. When Dennis and I team taught, he would talk about the swirling vortex of marital discord, because it was in the class we talked about marriage. But it's in any form of discord. discord. I'm so saddened when I see bumper stickers that say, I don't get mad, I get even. You know, those sorts of things. You know, people who are so quick now to jump to the next level rather than backing down and being civil. And I think we need to encourage more people doing the one downing. And those of you who've never tried it, it's a real healthy experience. It takes the fight out of the other person. What are they gonna do, argue? You were in fact wrong? They're just like, wow, okay. And you don't have to go further with it. Okay, so one downing, that was the one I almost skipped over. Another thing I did as a single, is Linda here? Linda Sorella, did she come? No, I don't see her. Uh, I got involved with rope training, high and low courses, and I got a lot of my certification completed. I, I may still want to pick that up. For those of you who don't know, high ropes is kind of like basic training, but we call it human development, okay? Uh, this was Camp Arnold. Any been out to Camp Arnold, high ropes? I have a pretty substantial fear of heights. And I do climb mountains, but that's a healthy thing when you're a mountain climber. I don't do technical, but get in some places where it's a little bit goosey. Part of the high ropes is to climb up 40 feet on these metal spikes that stick out of a tree. And then between two trees, 40 feet off the ground, is a 12 inch log secured. Not very big. Now on the ground, walking on it, it's a piece of cake, 40 feet up. Well, before you do this, you get to pick who's gonna be your coach. And I picked Linda Sorella. And she said, what do you want me to do? And I told her, and she said, that's what I'll do. I said, the rest of you, I want you to be quiet. I climbed, how many of you know about Elvis leg? <laughs> I'm standing up there. It's now 46 feet to the ground, and my leg starts going. <laughs> it's weird, it's uncontrollable. <laughs> I'm doing this Elvis, and we'd been warned about it. Well, I also stopped breathing, which is real common when you're in those. <laughs> so Linda's down there, breathe, Marty, breathe. Oh yeah, oxygen helps with Elvis leg. <laughs> Now, before you think I'm going to walk out there without you know, any sort of security, we are all roped in. 
And in fact, Linda is belaying me from below, or she's on guard, you know, in case I were to slip. And I started walking out, went to the end, turned around, walked back, came to the middle, and then fell backwards and let her let me get down to the ground. I can tell you, if you ever get a chance, high rope training is a very intriguing thing. It gives you more self-confidence. It makes you realize, and that's why they do it in you know, training for military. They want those guys and gals to be confident in any circumstance. Low ropes, uh, to be honest, I wasn't as, as excited by those, but the high ropes, man, if you get a chance, it's good, good training. Well, what did I pick up from this that was very useful? How many of you have had a challenge where you felt, oh my God, I can't do it, okay, for whatever reason? And somebody said, oh yeah, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. How many had that? I want to know. Does it help you? No. Dan, who taught the class, he pointed that out. If the person doesn't believe it'll work, you're saying you can do it doesn't help at all. But we were taught something that's a great lesson to learn. What you can say to the person is, is there anything I can do to help you be successful? person will usually pause and they'll say, yeah, if you did this, and now it comes from within the person. And there's a good chance you can help them. It also fits beautifully with the idea of scaffolding. Those of you who know about education theory, uh, you know, you take them from where they are and you help them get to the next step, but you don't do it for them. And you don't simply say, you can do it. So what could I do to help you be successful? I occasionally forget that but I try to put that in whenever there's a person doubting their abilities. Okay. The world of work. A lot of this relates to work. Doug Bernstein, you remember Doug, psychologist, teaches at, uh, well he was at University of Illinois at Champaign, I'm not sure where he is now, I think he's in Florida. He did workshops, and they were the best workshops I ever attended on teaching of psychology. Two things, well actually three, he actually put together a list of Ellis's things for teachers. Used to have it on the wall, I still have mine on my wall. But he also said two things that were so useful to me. He said, build a happiness file. How many of you have a happiness file right now? Only a small number of you. As Soon as you get back to your place of work, your office, if you're a student where you do your studying, Get a folder or a big envelope. Every good thing that happens to you, put it in there. And then on bad days, and we all have bad days, don't we? You can look at your happy file. Mine is really fat. Uh, it's bulging with letters, notes, awards, things I've you know, cherished over the years. Luckily, I've rarely had to turn to it, but I knew it was there. I knew my happy file was there if I needed it, okay? The other thing, and this is especially for those of you who are teachers or plan to be teachers, I think it also could apply to just anybody working. He said, in every lecture, do something that makes you giggle on the inside, <laughs> even if the class doesn't get it. <laughs> And I'm sure over the years, I've done things in class and started cracking up and students have thought, what the hell is <laughs> that about? But it kept me going. And it was funny, only an occasional lecture, there's always a few topics that just aren't fun topics and I couldn't find anything fun to do. But virtually every class I walked into, on the inside there was something just bubbling I couldn't wait to say or do. And that kept me fresh, okay? And those of you who are teachers, you do need to do that, okay. The later years, it's gonna work out pretty good. <laughs> I think in the last, oh, five or so years, I've become increasingly philosophic about things. Is Emily here? Kabaki? Yeah. By the way, she's a great teacher if you're looking for a class to take. I really enjoy it. I'd go in just for the fun of it sometimes. We even swapped classes one day. We didn't tell the administration. We just, <laughs> just did it. <laughs> it was a ball. It really was for each of us. 
So what have I learned philosophically? I think one of the first things I picked up on was at least my interpretation of a Zen idea, to give up expectations, but always maintain hope. And a lot of people get that kind of confused. I mean, you don't have expectations? No, because expectations almost always result in bad feelings. You expect certain things, it doesn't happen, then you're disappointed, okay? So I say, no, I don't expect it, but I'm certainly hopeful. Every class I walk into, this presentation, I'm hopeful that it's so good, I'm pleased at the end. But I certainly don't expect it, because I don't want to go away disappointed. And for those of you who get the drift of that, it's a nice little adjustment in the way you think about the world. Maintain hope, but don't have the expectations, okay? Quotation time. Rabbi Zusiah, he wrote, when I reach the world to come, God will not ask me why I wasn't more like Moses. He will ask me why I wasn't more like Zusiah. I think that I have become more myself. This is now me speaking. When I heard that, I thought, yeah, the research says often young adults try so hard to fit into their world instead of being who they are. And this is where I get to tell the younger people something that I hope makes them feel good. As you get older, you're going to become increasingly yourself. At least that's the typical finding. Some of what I am is a little bit irksome to people. But you know, I am a little bit of a show off, and I'm a little bit this and a little bit that. And I accept it. Okay, and my friends are probably pretty accepting of it too. But you've got to be true to yourself. It's a lot of work being somebody you're not. And eventually you're going to fail at being something you are not. Okay? Great existential questions. What is our purpose? What is the reason for our existence? Another writer who is a hero of mine Henry David Thoreau. Some of you know that Bill Krieger, who used to teach here, wonderful man, he built by hand a pretty much replica of the Thoreau cabin over here above the pond. And he said that Walden Pond was about the size of Lake Waghop. And he used to hold reading classes and English classes and summer things. And then, unfortunately, started getting vandalized and stuff happened and it had to be torn down. But, you know, that was kind of exciting that he was involved with Thoreau. And so I read more of Thoreau. And some of you are going to recognize this. I went into the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. I wanted to live deep and suck all the marrow of life. And of course, that was echoed in Dead Poets Society, which is one of the, I think, coolest films that's out there. If you've not seen it, you dig it out. I think it's Robin Williams' best film ever. But it's got some really strong messages about leading a life fully and being true to yourself, okay? Thoreau also said, most men lead lives of quiet desperation. I think that's all too true. I think although 80, 90% of Americans say they're Christian, I think most are not comfortable with the fact that eventually they're gonna die. Most, according to Maslow, lead half-led lives because the pervasive undercurrent, the fear of death, haunts them. I like Maslow because he talks about sometimes you have to take chances, but people would rather play it safe. And that's that quiet desperation piece. I don't know who said it, but I think Mullen used to use it. You got to let go of the pole to reach the brass ring. Now what's interesting, young people here probably have no clue what I just said. <laughs> and my guess is some of the older students or adults in here may not know either. 
in the old days, the merry-go-round. There was a little constant feed of brass rings that kind of dropped down by gravity. To get a ring, though, you had to let go of the pole and lean way out on your horse to snag it. And of course, they had a big pile of sawdust there because a large number of people fell off their horse. Okay? But I love that expression. You have to be willing to take some chances. But now going back to the Dead Poet Society, you don't fly into the flame if you're a moth. You don't take crazy risks, as some people do, most typically young guys because they think they're 10 foot tall and bulletproof. But if you're having a bad job, look into getting a different career. If your relationship really chucks, change it or think about a new relationship. Maslow was said to be selfish. And I think there's nothing wrong with being somewhat selfish. You need to be willing to do things that allow you to move. If it's a partner issue, invite them to move with you. But if they're unable or unwilling to move, sometimes you have to say, I only get one shot at this. And I need to reach for that brass ring. Okay? It's a nice little thing for people to contemplate. One of the things I share with some of my classes is my age. And we'll see how many can recall, because I just said it in one of my classes. How old am I? <laughs> Who said it? 26. Now, some of you are going, 26, the man's deluded. Well, actually, I suffer from progeria. Also, alopecia. And I'm going to die with that. <laughs> Glad some of you know these terms. What I'm talking about when I get into this with my class is how old I feel. And there is your chronological age, and that's 64 for me. But there's also your psychological age, how old you feel. I feel 26. It's part of why I really enjoy going up and having lunch with my students. I feel like I'm just slightly older than them on average. A couple of years out of grad school, teaching here for a couple of years, just kind of getting comfortable with that. Okay? And then I see my reflection. And I can tell some of you who are in the first couple of rows know what I'm talking about. It's like, oh my God, my dad took over my body. <laughs> who is this old guy in this young you know, person's body? Anyway. I'm 26. And this leads to an interesting thing. Days are long, years are short. When I first heard that, I thought, that's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and it's wrong. <laughs> My God, years are 365 times longer than a day, <laughs> duh. I can tell you, the older I become, the more true it is. I mean, I can look at Dennis and still see the cute little chubby cheeked boy in his leader hose. <laughs> I remember Jim Mullen telling me, God, Lobdell, to have thick hair. And I thought, well, oh, big deal. <laughs> I think differently about that now. Okay. The years are going to fly by. And you're going to be someday standing in front of a group, thanking them, because you're going to be retiring. And you're going to go, where did those years fly by to? My little kids are now approaching 40. 40, my little babies, okay? And their little babies will be grown all too soon, okay? Trust me, days are long, years are short. This gets me to my last honoree. He's in the back row. His name is Steve Jake. We have an award here called the Distinguished Faculty Award. It's uh, looked at by faculty and then bestowed on a faculty member. And through the years, I mean, some really wonderful teachers have been honored. One of the early ones, you were about second or third year, can you remember? Was it the first? Okay, I'm confused. Clark St. Dennis was maybe right after you. Were you second? I don't know. <laughs> Tell me about days and years, okay? <laughs> Steve 
was the uh, person who won the award. And he talked about the value of humanities. Now, this has been a number of years ago. And I've had so many students tell me what I said. And I go, I've never said that. <laughs> but, but what I remember, the message, and I think I'm correct, was something to the effect that the sciences, of course, help with technology and math. That's the same, and da-da-da. But the humanities make, makes life worth living. Something to that effect. Was, am I close to that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And you talked about how your poetry or your prose classes had helped people have new ways of viewing the world. I remember sitting there being so impressed. It was a great, great talk. And I thought to myself, when I took my lit classes and learned some poetry or some you know, prose, I didn't quite get it. I thought, how can you make a living at this? How is this going to give me a job? So I was looking at that functional aspect. And what I didn't realize is what you said in that talk was true. It was giving me a new appreciation, a new understanding. It was making my life worth living. So it was like you clarified something that had been going on for a number of years. I really appreciated that. So I'm going to close with a poem. One of my favorite poets, A.E. Hausman, and obviously those of you who teach, you know about Hausman. This one goes something like this. Loveliest of trees, the cherry now is hung with bloom along the bough and stands about the woodland ride wearing white for Easter tide. Now of my three score years and ten, Twenty will not come again. And take from seventy springs a score. It only leaves me fifty more. And since to look at things in bloom, fifty springs leave little room. About the woodlands I will go to see the cherry hung in snow. When I first read that poem, I was twenty years old. And that catchy little thing about of my three score years and 10, 20 will not come again, that's me, OK? Well, now I've passed the three scores, OK? I think now I'm going to get more than the plus 10. Actuarial tables say I should go to at least mid-80s, but who knows? <laughs> but anyway, I love the poem. Because once again, it's about enjoying life and living it to the fullest. I usually talk about this in my lifespan development, the last lecture. And I talk about something that I find so sad. I used to commute, and I'd go by the cemeteries up above Chamber Creek. And I'd pass by and look at people in the cemetery, often down, prostate on the ground, crying, apparently wailing, gnashing their teeth. And I think to myself, did they show any of that emotion when the person was living? And my guess is, sometimes they hadn't. And they came to realize something, that once a person's dead, you can't have those conversations. So it's springtime. The cherry was hung in snow. OK, it's now past that. But I think appreciating not only life, but those in your life, and sharing that with them is very important. I thank you for coming. It's been a great ride. And it's what, 3 o'clock? There's going to be some sort of a function up in the Rainier building. Thank you. I'll do it again. Thank you very much. Thank you.